Hello and welcome to Crisis What Crisis, a new podcast series designed to be a useful field guide as we all try to navigate and come to terms with a dramatically changed world. Whether personal, professional or both, crisis is without doubt the new shared experience. I'm Andy Coulson, a former newspaper editor, Downing Street Director of Communications and inmate of HMP Belmarsh. For the last four years, I've been trying to put all my experience, the good and the bad, to use as a strategic advisor to business leaders. And I can tell you that the bad has been just as useful as the good. And that got me thinking that there are plenty of great podcasts out there where you can hear stories of success. There are far fewer where you can benefit from the experience of those whose lives have properly unravelled. So in Crisis What Crisis, I'll be talking to the embattled, shamed, courageous, ruined, damaged, resilient, unlucky and lucky survivors of crisis. Some names will be familiar, some less so, uh, but our guests will talk about their experiences honestly, often with humour, but always in the hope that what they have to share might be useful to anyone facing down their own demons and challenges. Put simply, these are crisis stories worth sharing. For this first podcast, I'm joined by legendary broadcaster and journalist Jeremy Bowen, the BBC's multi-award-winning Middle East editor. Jeremy is, I think, the perfect person for us to begin this conversation about crisis, to explore what actually defines a crisis, and more importantly, to discover how you can survive, perhaps even thrive, if you find yourself in the midst of one. I say perfect because since he joined the BBC in 1984, Jeremy has almost constantly been in the company of crisis. Mainly, it has to be said, as a willing volunteer. He's had a front row seat as the deadliest of crises exploded, quite often literally, in countries including Iraq, Bosnia, Kosovo and Egypt. In fact, he's reported into our living rooms from more than 90 different countries. Jeremy has also seen how crisis is created, handled, often manipulated in his interviews with political and military leaders, including Gaddafi and Assad. And he's been right there as an eyewitness to the frankly horrific consequences of war for innocent civilians and on occasions uh, for his close friends. More recently, Jeremy found himself facing down an altogether different crisis, this time as a conscript rather than a volunteer. And I'm delighted to say that he stared down that personal challenge, a cancer diagnosis, and he's now thankfully in remission. Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us today. After that intro, one might expect you to be a somewhat world-weary individual, but I'm lucky enough to have been a pal of yours for a number of years, and that's far from the truth. So is your sense of humour as important a piece of armory as that Kevlar vest we see you wearing on TV? Yeah, you know, well, first of all, thanks, Andy, for that very nice, fulsome um, introduction. Uh, the, I think it's really important to try and retain a sense of perspective. And yes, deriving some humour from a situation or seeing the lighter side, the brighter side, as well as the darker side, is a, a part of, of trying to cope with stressful events, stressful situations. I think that if you're the kind of person who is so, if you cannot see the light and shade of a situation, then you can become paralyzed in terms of the way that you deal with it. So yeah, humor is, I think, part of it. I mean, not that I'm a comedian or tell jokes the whole time, but you've got to see the, um, the amusing side of it. The first war I went to, which was in El Salvador in 19... 19- 89, uh, one of the first times I actually came, uh, well, not direct under fire, but people started shooting and it was all going crazy. And I was with a group of other journalists and there was a, there was a trench that, not a trench, it was a ditch that the soldiers had been using as a toilet. And so we had a choice of standing up where the bullets were flying or diving into the shit. So of course we dove into the shit and so we're sitting there laughing. Yeah, how, do you, laugh. how do you see the funny, you had you to see laugh. the funny side of that? <laughs> it was just, at the time, it was quite amusing. It wasn't that, you know, there were dry bits. You, yeah. you know, you, it wasn't like it was a, yeah. a, a four-foot deep drain <laughs> sewer. But it was, there were plenty of nasty little packages all over the place. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, so, you know, you've got to laugh in those sorts of situations. And, and, and actually, they were using heavy machine guns around the place, so we hadn't done taking a dive goodness knows what would have happened yeah 
Uh, you were you were born in Wales, and your dad Gareth um, is a senior journalist, and your mum's a photographer. Do you do you, and your dad, in fact, I think covered the uh, Aberfan disaster in in 1966. Um, that sort of proximity to hard news obviously inspired you, but do you think it also trained you a bit uh, for some of the situations you found yourself in? Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe you know, it's um, the news was normal in in my house most of the time. I always wanted to be a journalist, to be honest. And I do remember my father going to Aberfan and coming back with I was only six. Um, and coming back with um, muck all over his trousers. He'd gone there wearing a suit, spent, you know, 40 hours there or something, and came back with a suit covered in slurry and the car covered in slurry. And uh, and then he slept for ages in the middle of the day. I remember that. Mm. Um, and he did, he did a great piece, actually. Uh, I was really pleased at the anniversary. I pointed it out um, to the PM program, and they ran it. Uh, on the, the anniversary of the of what happened there, the the I suppose it would have been the fiftieth anniversary, and uh, yeah, so uh, he he did a great job of reporting on that particular day, but uh, yes, it did uh, it did it did actually um, make me aware of the world of news. My mother wanted to go up and take photos, but my uh, she she called up my uh, my granny and said, look you know, what's gone on now, Bavan, I want to take some pictures. Can I go up there? Would you look after the kids? Because uh, I had three small, I had two small brothers at that point. My sisters weren't born. And my granny said, there's no place for a woman. You're certainly not going up there. Uh, so she was, she's always been a bit disappointed. She could have been one of the first photographers there and got some incredible photographs. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so news was always something that was there. I mean, some people hold to the theory that, that the ability to kind of cope with, you know, properly stressful situations, and frankly, Abhavan, you, you, it's hard to imagine, you know, uh, just how, just how uh, heartbreaking a, a place that must have, that must have been, um, at, you know, th- at, at that moment. Um, th- there's a sort of, you know, there's almost a kind of chemical or, 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 or some kind of sort of genetic, you know, sort of stress code that, that's, that's, that, can be, that can be transferred I mean, do you, you know, is, is stress a, is, or, or do you see it as, as a sort of muscle? Do you, do you think you've been able to cope with so many? We'll get into them in, in, in more detail as, as, as we talk more, but because you've been through the most extraordinary, extraordinary sort of stressful situations. Do you think it's a muscle? Do you think that the fact that you did so much of it, did you find it easier as time went on, if you like, to, to, to kind of deal with those moments? I think you acquire certain familiarity and you know things, for example, um, if I was heading for a dangerous place, I'd always feel quite nervous before I went. But when I got there, a lot less nervous, and it would normally be not as bad as you thought it was. Mm. And so I know now that if I, I don't do it quite so much now, but if I was to go off somewhere horrible, I would be a bit tense beforehand. But I'd know in my head that I'd be able to cope when I got there. Uh, and the thing is, though, is, is how you respond when you first turn up or find yourself in that kind of situation. So I think some of it is innate, as a matter of fact. And there's a Canadian psychologist who studied all this kind of thing. He's particularly studied journalists who go to wars. Mm. And he said that there are certain, he thinks there's a certain, I can't remember what it was, a certain chemical that you might have a bit more of. Um, I think it might be part, partly the kind of chemical that makes young men do stupid things on motorbikes perhaps uh and because a lot of p i've had you know plenty of colleagues who've gone on to you know most journalists do not do what i've done over the years uh who've gone on to have very you know glittering careers who one look at the kind of you know some reporting in nasty places in war zones and thought, well, that, just, that is just not for me. I'm just not going to do that. That's insane. Yeah. Whereas some people would be intrigued. And I was one of those people. I, would, I was intrigued by my own responses as well as by the, the situation. And I think that's one reason why it becomes, you know, it can become addictive, actually. Your um, your early career was you know was stellar. You're you know the BBC's man in Geneva at the age of twenty eight. As you mentioned, eighty nine. You're reporting from El Salvador. 
Uh, but then in, in 91, you suffer what uh, I, um, I sort of suggest might have been your first crisis of confidence when you're not included in the, in the lineup for, uh, for the first Gulf War. I had nothing to do. It was really, really awful. Hmm. But then John Simpson came out of Baghdad after a day or two. They kicked all the journalists out when it all started. Uh, and, the B- and, and, and he was ill. He was taken ill. So uh, the BBC called me. My ally, the foreign editor, John Marnie, rang me and said, look, we've got a berth for you. Do you want to go into Baghdad? So I went from nothing to what I saw as the, the biggest job. For me, that was a huge breakthrough story because it went okay. But yes, uh, but it went fact, better than uh, okay. You you end, you end up sort of in the most extraordinary of circumstances. I mean, you're and you're reporting on a on a on a huge story, uh, and also quite a controversial story, right? In terms of the reporting of it, I mean, it it was a incredibly must have been a incredibly stressful to have been there. I mean, talk us through it. You know the you know the the the, the, the attack that in the end you know, caused people to question, you know, your impartiality in the way that you were reporting it? Well, yes. While I was there, just arrived, um, there was uh, a devastating attack by the Americans on a purpose-built shelter that was housing hundreds of civilians and killed, I think it's more than 400. And the you know, it was the enemy capital. Uh, and for those who don't remember that particular time, Britain hadn't been at war for quite a while. There'd been the Falklands, but that had been quite remote. And there'd been such a run-up to the the 1991 Gulf War that it, it later on in Afghanistan and Iraq, war almost became part of the routine of the country. But 91, it was something new. Uh, and there I was in the the enemy capital, and I heard Marie Colvin. Actually, I got up, I got up early, usual time, and I was walking down the hotel corridor. And Marie Colvin, a great friend of mine, who of course sadly got killed a few mm. years ago in Syria, I said, "Have you heard what's happened?" And I said, "What? What? There's been she's, there's been an attack." So, unlike all the other things where the Iraqis would say, "Right, we're going to take you there," they said, "Just go, just go, just go." So we went. Uh, all the journalists, we went to this shelter and they were pulling out bodies and fragments of bodies uh, and they were women, children, old men. And it seemed to me, a, you know, it was horrendous. There was were... your first experience of sort of, you know, death if you know, in its most sort of vis- visceral form, if I can put it that way. Um, I mean, yeah. No, I'd seen bodies. I'd, I've done, I've been um, on a few tough stories at that point. I'd been to that war in Afghanistan, in, in El Salvador. I'd been in Afghanistan when the Russians were leaving. Uh, I got locked up there for a few days. And then I was, was back again in Afghanistan after that. And I'd done a few other things. So I wasn't completely green about the gills. But it's quite rare, even in the years since then, that I have seen so many, you know, piles and piles and piles of corpses many of them blown to bits or so burnt they looked like charred pieces of wood being just heaped up in the back of lorries and pickup trucks and taken taken away to another place and and what had happened was that the uh the, it was a fairly middle class area and the the men of the house of the houses would put the families and the and their dads their granddads into this shelter at night then they go back and guard their houses uh, so they thought the families were safe and that they were taking the risk. In fact, it was, turned out to be the other way around. So I thought it was it was horrendous, but it was a pretty obvious story what had happened. They bombed an air raid shelter. Hmm. And I, I also thought, well, they can't have done it deliberately. They're not that stupid. It must be some sort of mistake. So I was absolutely, literally gobsmacked when I did a um, live. We were just starting doing live TV. 24 7 at that time and uh and peter sissons started interrogating me and said he said the pentagon and the mod are saying that this is a was a command center and the and they were all military in there i said i was i was amazed that he was even asking the question that they were saying these things i said well no peter i can only go by i remember using this phrase like and in the subsequent days i repeated it quite a bit i said i can only go by what i've seen myself and what i've heard myself 
And I'm telling you, I have seen the bodies and none of them were, were men of military age. None of them were, um, were soldiers. They weren't wearing uniforms. They were civilians. And mm-hmm. there were old, old men and there were children and there were women. And I've spoken to any number of, of families who told me that they put their... I said, no, it was an air raid shelter. And I stuck to my guns. And then there was a hoo-ha in the tabloid press to my amazement. No internet in those days. You didn't know what was in the papers unless someone told you. Yeah. And we didn't have phones that worked. We just had sat phones, which had very limited access to because of the Iraqis. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, and it said that the, the key, th- I mean, the worst headline was uh, Lord Haw Haw reborn in Baghdad. Yeah. You know, William which you don't Joyce. Want to re- which you don't, which is something you do not want to read yeah. about yourself, right? William, William Joyce, you know, the yeah. man executed for treason for broadcasting yes. from Berlin. I was being compared to a big picture of me and a small picture of, of him uh, in, um, I think it was a star. And anyway, um, I was a different, entirely that, so. different type of stress, but that, that <laughs> must have been, you know, well, uh, uh, my, uh, my ITN, um, pressure colleague stroke opponent on that story, Brent Sadler came up to me and he said, I understand there's a big row and, uh, and it's gone to the board of management level at the BBC being about your reporting, Jeremy. It's a big, big stink in the, in the press. Uh, he's playing mind games. I said, I've, I've no idea, Brent. I've no so idea. Camar- so camaraderie, doing my job. camaraderie up to a point. Well, as you know, journalism yeah. is full of camaraderie. Exactly. Like exactly. And good lad. Then I always respected him. I always feared Brent as, a, as an opponent, actually. He was very, very good at his job. Yeah. And not a bad bloke either. Do you remember seeing your first um, you know, dead body on yes. the job, so to speak? It was in that war in El Salvador on day one, as a matter of fact. The... Um, cameraman I was working with who was Salvadorian and for him it was just you know it was a day at the office I think but for me it was a big deal I'd never seen a dead body and he said oh they found there's a, there was there was a, a big rebel offensive into the capital which is why I was there and he said they've they've shot one of the uh, gorillas around the corner do you want to come and take a look okay so I went to look and they were burning the body in a, in a pit and it was definitely a human being roasting you know you could see the the human flesh roasting on this wood fire it looked a bit like pork uh and i was i'd been very curious about how i'd respond when i saw a dead body and actually i was fine i didn't faint or be sick or anything like that i was fine and what i learned subsequently was what is far more distressing are people who are alive who Mm. um when they're dead, there's nothing you can do for them. But when you're alive, you're aware of the suffering and the pain and the anguish that they're going through and the families are going through. But someone who's, you know, just lying there, it's a, it's a it's somewhat a different thing. You mentioned earlier that you, you know, this, this is the early days of, of running uh, 24 hour news. Um, what impact do you think that that sort of technological change had on international crisis because there's obviously more reporting there's more transparency there's more truth um but there are other impacts as well i mean leaders you know some of whom you've you know you you've you've interviewed you know the good and the bad pretty quickly learned how to how to leverage the value of 24-hour news i mean what's your what's your sort of analysis of its of its value and yes it is it is very it's 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 different insofar as uh, we can, if you're somewhere dangerous, then you re- you spend longer in the danger zone because you report from the danger zone more. It used to be you dip in, get the story, and get out to some place where they had communications. And now there are communications everywhere, so you don't have to get out in the same in the same way. And of course, what you have to be aware of is that that politicians are not just politicians sometimes dangerous men with guns uh, are watching what you're doing and making their own mind up about how they can influence yes it's that and that can be relatively benign or it can be quite dangerous can you think of an example there where where, where your presence your kind of you know your your being there is is being manipulated or used or to, you know essentially to make a you know a, a bad situation worse well i don't think it's necessarily i hope to, i hope that i'm not being manipulated i hope i 
able to see through attempts to do that. And I've always been a big believer as a reporter in in going to the narrowing the distance between myself and the story yeah. and using my own faculties rather than re relying on on briefings. But of course, if you're covering, say, uh, things you've been involved in in politics, then it's a different sort of story because you're trying to find out what's going on on the inside. So therefore, you're quite dependent on your sources. Mm. You can't use your eyes on that sort of that kind of reporting. Um, there have been other times. I mean, when it was really just starting in Sarajevo uh, in uh, the sort of early 90s, mid 90s, it would have been 93, this particular incident. There was a big um, storm, newspaper storm about uh, evacuating children from the city. Yeah. And there was, uh, we did a story about one particular little girl who was very badly hurt. And it was a quiet time. It was a summer and felt very, you know, unusually. A, a lot of Fleet Street was there. And there was a huge storm about this girl who ended up being um, evacuated to Great Ormond Street Hospital. She was called Irma Hajimuradovic. And uh, we did the main part of the story. Uh, but then the government wanted, the major government wanted to tap into seemed to want to tap into that because there was a pressure to do something to deal with this war that seemed to be insoluble so they sent over um uh, a hospital plane to to evacuate kids and, and they, an, R, an raf doctor and a few other people were going around the hospital almost picking children to to evacuate they're only there for half a day and i got to know these guys and i showed them i i knew all the doctors and Anyway, uh, there was one who was particularly ill, but he hadn't been blown up. He had kidney problems and it was, he had a very engaging parents and mother. And, and I said, look, you've got to take this kid. And he said, we got out of the room. He said, no, no, we can't do that because kids die of kidney disease in Britain. We're going to have to leave him. Sorry. Mm, have to die course. here. Yeah. And I was outraged by that. And mm. this is the only time I've ever tried to manipulate something myself. Yeah, and so with the um, the guy from the UN Refugee Agency, we did a story saying it was absolutely disgraceful that some kids were being left behind, and that was on the one o'clock news. And I had a frantic meeting with this RAF doctor an hour or two later, saying, "Where is that boy? We have to take him. We have to take him." So presumably, someone in number ten had seen the their choreographed event yes. going wrong. And wanted to try and remedy it. So of course, yeah, they took the kid, and he, well, he didn't live forever. He lived for he lived for about he got a kidney transplant, and he lived for, um, I think, five or ten years. And they had more time with his family, yeah. And that was something. So uh, it's a bit a, it's a slippery slope though if you try and get involved in those kinds of things. I try and be quite old fashioned about it, and I don't really bother too much about what people say. Or try to. I, I certainly don't try and actively influence things. That was the only ever, only time I ever tried to do it, um, because I thought what was going on was outrageous. But my view is is that if the the event that you're covering the story is strong enough, then it tells its own tale. Let's um, let's move on to former Yugoslavia and a story that became you know a very significant part of your life, and it was also I think I'm right in saying the first time that you were you know sort of directly shot at. Um, that's, that's you know you should, you should sort of ask someone tell me about the first time you were shot at. Uh, it's <laughs> I mean we're having a conversation about crisis and 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 stress. What do you remember about about, about that situation and your well, reaction to it? Well, it wasn't the first time I've been shot. I've been shot at quite a lot of times. Um, and maybe not directly shot at myself. Um, in other places i've been in places where shooting was going on yes and i got caught up in it but certainly on the uh when i went to sarajevo for the first time during the war when it just started i arrived we arrived there and um i certainly remember one particular incident where uh i had i I'd just arrived and uh, was just trying to try and grab something to eat and i was gonna go up to my room and normally when you go to a hotel, you know, you look for the lift, you get in the lift, you've got your room key and you go, you find the right floor and you get out of the lift. And, but what no one had got around to telling me was that you shouldn't at that particular time go to the front of this hotel, the Holiday Inn in Sarajevo, because it faced down onto the front line. Hmm. 
and literally i mean it was as the time went by in the war it was hit so often the front of the hotel was destroyed and we lived at the back um but i it was dark i got out i pressed my button the third floor whatever it was and i got out of the lift and as the the light within the lift the door opened i must have been illuminated and bang this bullet hit the edge of the frame of the lift and there was a sniper opposite who was clearly waiting for people to try to come out of the lift because then there was a signal and when the light came and as soon as the light came on he'd take a shot and which came in through the window of the hotel and bashed into the frame work of the lift next to me luckily he missed it was quite a difficult shot i think and he probably wasn't getting many opportunities because most people weren't dumb enough to take the lift. I never took the lift again in that <laughs> hotel. Uh, and shortly after that, it stopped working. Uh, but yeah, that was quite personal. In so do you remember, far how, you, as... do you remember how, you, how you felt, um, uh, you know, immediately, immediately <laughs> afterwards? I, mean... um, I didn't feel too alarmed about it. I thought, well, this is a war. You know, people are going to turn their bullets flying around. If you're not careful, you get your head in the wrong place, you might get a bullet in it. So I wasn't uh, too alarmed. I probably went downstairs and told all my colleagues and had a drink and had a laugh about it. I would have thought. You, you, used, know, the word, that... um, you used the word addiction earlier. Yeah. I mean, do you do you think that you, by this stage, had become had become addicted to danger? Thoroughly, I'd say. By then, I was in my well in the war in Sarajevo. I was in my early thirties. I was pretty much on top of everything. I thought I was full of energy probably full of testosterone i was you know i i was very very engaged in the story i had seen early on that being in a the first time i was in a place where there was shooting going on in el salvador then afterwards there was this big high because you're in a dangerous situation you get out of it so i felt um I felt, you know, celebratory. I felt that I, you know, I got out of some real scrape and, mm. you know, I went to have a few drinks and, uh, and there was this, uh, the hotel everybody stayed in, you know, it was a lovely tropical night and we sat outside net and the war was going on in the city. You could see the tracer. And I thought, my God, I'm in a war movie here. It's incredible. I'm in my own personal war mind, movie. There was some, you know, glamour is perhaps not the right word to use. Oh, yeah, it was quite glamorous in a way. It was yeah. like being in a film. Um, yeah. And and Sarajevo, in a, in a rough way, was a bit like that too at times. Yeah. But I soon realized that, that be, the nature of the work that we were doing, which meant we were often coming into people's lives at their worst moments, their worst, worst moments, meant that it was... It would just be, you know, deeply prurient, horrible thing to do just if you got a buzz out of it. Yeah. There had to be a reason for doing it. And for me, there was a very strong journalistic reason for doing these sorts of stories and everything else came with it. I felt that there was no justification for being some kind of a war tourist. You had to be there for, for a reason. And I also, at that point, by this stage in Sarajevo in the 90s, I liked, and Bosnia in general, I did some trips elsewhere in the, in the, in the informal Yugoslavia, a lot of them. Um, it was all about, for me, it was about the story, first of all. I felt really strongly that there was this war going on in Europe, not far from where we all lived, where you know, there were scenes that hadn't been seen since the Second World War. And it, after a while, it just became part of the background hum. It didn't, it wasn't significant. The government wasn't doing what it could to end it. Uh, and I was really exercised about that. But well, the, the, things, the, the, the other stuff that went with it was, was, was you know, it was part of it. And they, yeah, I, anybody who does this kind of work, if they say, I didn't enjoy it at times. I didn't get a buzz out of it. Then they're lying. You know, you've been in the room with so many people facing existential crisis in their lives. What have you learned? The, the kind of common themes, if you like, between those who can cope with those kind of situations and those who can't. 
I do think that you can see people who are sometimes better able to get through crises than, than others. And as we may have mentioned before, it, I think a lot of that's because if you, you know, take one thing at, at, at a time, get through the day, do the things that you have to do. Don't get overwhelmed by the, the big picture that you're in a horrendous situation. Just say, well, you know, I've got to do four things before the middle of the, of the day. I've got to get some food for this. I've got to get through that. I've got to get some water. Uh, and, and then you've done that and tick that off and then do some more things. And we adapt as human beings. We can adapt. And one, another thing I've seen is that if you get through it, things do get better. Mm. Things are not awful forever. Things do get better. There is a something along the other end. I've seen that from going back to places where I was when they were in an awful state, whether it be former Yugoslavia or uh, different parts of the of the world where I've been, where where they've gone through awful crises and you know they've emerged at the other end. Hmm. So we, you know, we'll get there in the end. Sometimes it's very difficult and very dangerous and not everybody makes it. But that one but thing at a there. time, deal with what you can deal with. I think so. Uh, yeah. So don't give up, but, but that ability to kind of be sort of present, if you like, in the, in however bad a situation you do, find yourself in. I think chip away at the problem. Don't, don't get overwhelmed by the weight of the, of, of the big picture. The fact that, there's some, you know, at the moment we've got this horrendous medical emergency going on that might last for a long, a long time. So in terms of trying to get through that, I'm not going to tell people what to do or preach to them, but get through every day, set some targets, have some structure. And I think in war zones, that's what people do. They're forced into it. Wars are a bit different, but they're, to survive in a war zone, you have to do a lot of small things every day just to get through it, just to keep yeah. life going. Can we go, um, can we go to what you've described as the, the sort of worst day of your life? Uh, May 23rd, 2000. Um, just tell us um, what, what, what happened that day and, 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 and how as, as much, as much as you're able. Um, and I know that you've, you've, you've talked about this before, but, how do you cope with a situation um, so uh, uh, so close and so personal and so upsetting? But uh, you know, rather rather than me explain, uh, if if you don't mind, would you just tell us the story? Well, what happened that day was that my good friend and colleague, driver and fixer in Lebanon, uh, Abed Takush, was killed uh, while I was with him by the Israelis. They fired a tank shell into the back of his car, uh, and it blew up and uh, and he was killed uh and he he managed to struggle i was about i'd got out of the car about a few minutes before with the cameraman to do a piece to camera and he had stayed in because he was on a phone call uh what was happening was that the israelis were withdrawing from south lebanon after a very long occupation and they were leaving through one particular gate in the the border like sort of you know like water draining out of a bath the level of the israelis in that area was going down we've been very careful not to tangle with them get close to them as they were retreating through south lebanon and going out through mm -hmm. through this one particular gate but i just none of us thought that they fire across the border which is what they did he was a real old war horse i bet he he loved it he loved um covering dangerous stories in Lebanon he'd been doing it since the start of the, the civil war in the in 1975 when he was a young taxi driver in his early 20s and by 2000 he was well he was in his mid 50s and his job essentially was to help you get where you needed to be right yeah it was a fixer we, yeah. we depend on fixers foreign correspondents locals whoever how well you know a country you don't know it as well as someone who lives there and he was a fixer par excellence, and he was also a driver. He fancied himself as a speedster. He had an old Mercedes taxi. Yeah. And, uh, and he had a family business, right? I mean, it was... Well, uh, the whole family were in it. They still are, actually. 
Yeah. Uh, and yeah, they, they drove journalists around the whole family. He had nephews, an uncle. Uh, yeah, there was a, and, and he was, he stayed, he was in his car. He he'd normally get out of the car because he felt the car was a target and, and best to be clear of it. Uh, so he stayed in the car because he was fixing the Israelis left unexpectedly early. They were meant to be leaving a month later and they left quickly. I happened to be in Lebanon. So we were on the story fast, but other people were coming in and he was on the phone fixing drivers for his family, for people, clients who were coming into the airport. Uh, and he was talking to his son about it. In fact, when the shell hit the car um, and so, you know, we all knew what we were in and the dangers of the situation. But no, it's horrific because we, myself and the cameraman Malik, we were pinned down. I said to Malik, let's get up there and see him because I'd saw him. He managed to force his way out of the car window and his, he was clo his clothes were on fire. He was on fire. Goodness, you're, you're, you're how far from this? 50 yards, maybe. And uh, he, so Malik said, no, don't go up there because he's dead. You know, he may have got out of the car, but the, the blast will have killed him. And if you go out there now and expose yourself, because we were, happened to be at the lee of a building, he said, the Israelis will kill you. Do not do not do it. And I know that this was the fact because the, the, the Times correspondent, um, his driver was listening to the Israeli radio traffic. And he heard them say, we've got one of them. We'll get the other two with the machine gun. And when finally I did stick my nose out because I couldn't bear it any longer, five or 10 minutes later, they opened up with a heavy machine gun with a 50 caliber on the tank. And I heard the bullets, you know, going very close to me. It makes a particular noise. So I know that if I had tried to do the heroic thing and go up and see my friend and, and have a, you know, a Hollywood moment of being, of him dying in my arms or something. You would have died. It, I would have been killed. I wouldn't have made it up there but I still felt really bad that I hadn't tried. Yeah. And uh, no, that was, that was, it was different to all the other dangerous events that I've been part of because it was very personal. They targeted us. They killed a man who I liked and respected. The next day I had to, I went to Beirut for his funeral and all the, he lived in an apartment building in a part of the city called Hamra. And all the men were sitting outside in the courtyard on chairs and the women were inside in the, in the apartment. He's a Sunni Muslim. And so they said, the message came down. Would you go up and talk to the women? So his wife, I'd never, never even met his wife. Um, and so they were all up there and I had to explain what was going on, what had happened blow by blow. The whole thing was horrendous. Um, so how do you, how do you begin to, you know, deal with that how do you begin to sort of process well, I, at the time i was very upset about it and uh, i had and the bbc very decent about these things and they said look what you want to do just go you don't have to keep on with this story go home if you want which was jerusalem for me at the time the home, home yeah. was jerusalem uh so what happened was that i said no i'll keep on going with the story and my partner julia was there funnily enough running the bbc operation mm. she was pregnant with our first kid uh, and she, um, I mean, they, she, 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 and the, some valued colleagues from the UN who she was liaising with and helped, they were also working together. They heard for a while from good source that there were, um, two bodies on the road and they hadn't heard from me. My phone had been burnt in the car. Um, I never leave my phone in the car anymore. Um, they thought I was dead for a couple of hours, I think. Yeah. So the whole thing was, was horrific. Um, they, we couldn't get up his body off the road for a long time. In the end, the Lebanese um, Red Crescent liaised through the UN with the Israelis and arranged for an ambulance to go and pick him up and take him to the morgue. And I, the one thing I regret is I didn't see his body. I didn't have the guts. I didn't want to see him and they his his nephew had come down to pick up his body said do you want to come and see him and i 
my biggest regret is I didn't didn't say yes. I just couldn't but do that's, it. That's to anyone listening to this would be entirely understandable. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was it was hard. And then a colleague of mine who I I, I didn't really know, in fact, um, a woman a bit older, came up to me a day or two later because you know she, everyone had heard what had happened. Small world journalism, and uh, and she said. She said, look, something similar happened to me in um, Central America years ago. She said, I was in a, an ambush and my colleagues were killed and I survived. And she said, believe you me, you need to go and see someone about this because you regret it if you don't. Because at the time, I was getting on with my job. I felt okay. And, and funnily enough, when I got back the day after the funeral, uh, I went back down to the south and uh, was there was a big follow-on story going on and i heard and a colleague said you know and it was terrible as well my god what happened to you was awful but have you heard about what was terrible what happened in sierra leone too i said what happened in sierra leone um and what happened was that two colleagues of mine who had been working in africa friends who from the the war in bosnia kurt Schork and miguel gill had been killed the following day, the day I was at the funeral, they were killed in an ambush. And two other friends who were with them, two other journalists, again from Bosnia, uh, were, were w- wounded and had to hide in the jungle while these squads were going around trying to find them to kill them for a couple of hours. So, you know, it, my whole world was uh, was taking a lot of hits at the okay. time because yeah. um, I was being was close to these two guys who were killed. So... You know, these are three people I knew in separate wars, separate continents, who were who were killed more or less at the same time, and it did make me think very hard about my life and what I was was doing. But I had some therapy after that, and I I started having symptoms of PTSD, um, hypervigilance, bad dreams, various other yeah. symptoms, classic classic symptoms. Um, and I went back to London and I saw this guy, and it was very helpful actually. But these things leave a permanent mark on you, no question about it. And this this particular incident left a much bigger mark on me than all the other war zones I'd been in before or since because of it was, you know, it was personal. Yeah. But you're an, you're a strong advocate of the value of counselling. Oh God, I've had loads of counselling. I've had I've had a couple of years of counselling in total. Yeah. And uh no, I've suffered subsequent I've suffered depression, all sorts of things. Um and I think it's the key thing is getting the, the right counsellor. Mm. I had false starts with some useless people who left if, had I not pulled out would have made things worse, not better. Well, you I just, just you just what, felt they didn't get it? Or well, I they, just, they didn't the right get it. They weren't interested. Or... They weren't asking the right questions. I don't know. They're, some were doing their best. Others weren't do, trying too hard at all. Um, there was one woman I went to see who said, you know, you won't be able to get to grips with any of this until you go and do some really serious work at this place in America I, I've connected with. It's only $30,000. And, uh, you know, they'll give you a very intense week there. I said, I don't need... I want to talk to you now. I don't want to go to America and spend 30 grand on this. Thank you very much. Oh, I think it's going to be very useful for you. <laughs> and it was just a scam. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I, um, I'm, I think if you get the right therapist and you have an issue in your life, frankly, even if you don't, you just need to talk about things. I think it's very helpful. I'm a big believer in, in counseling and therapy. You go forward to, um, 2003 in the Gulf War and yeah. you're, you're asked whether or not you want to go and you decide not to. One assumes yeah. that everything that had preceded had, uh, had obviously kind of caused you to see the job in a very different way. Well, I'd become a father and the second one was on the way. Yeah, uh, He was born, my son was born in uh, July of 2003 and the invasion of Iraq was in March of 2003 and after the, I'd already been talking to um, the BBC about coming back and presenting breakfast when Abbott was killed in um, in Lebanon, and I and and you know Miguel and Kurt were killed, and so I thought, well, actually, this is a sign. This is a good idea. So I did that for a couple of years. I was a presenter, on morning TV, which was a 
a madly different world to the world I was used to. But then I decided to go back and be a reporter because I, I thought, well, I used to be quite a good journalist and now I've got a job where I'm sitting on the sofa telling jokes and interviewing actors. And I'm not sure it's really me. I've got a bit more reporting left in me. Yeah, I was only 40. So uh, 40, 42 or something. And uh, so then the just as I was going back into it, the war started. And because I'd been in Baghdad in the, the previous war, when the guy who was meant to be there uh, couldn't make it, couldn't, they, they wouldn't give him a visa. They asked, BBC asked me if I would do it. The Iraqis had said, we'll give Bowen a visa. So initially I said yes, and I was so tormented by it. And actually if I'd gone there, probably, I probably again, I would have been all right. But my partner was pregnant. We had a baby. Um, these memories of what had happened in 2000 were very strong. I started getting dreams about burying the cameraman in a shallow grave at the uh, outside the hotel where we always stayed in Baghdad. Um, and I thought, no, I'm not going to do it. And they were my employers, I have to say, because I really left them in a pickle, uh, were very decent about it. And they said, fine, your decision. You don't, that's good, don't worry. And they didn't try and change my mind. But it was pretty awful on, as a journalist sitting there and watching everybody else covering themselves in glory and doing an amazing story. Um, when I was <laughs> just, I was sitting watching Postman Pat with my, uh, my, my daughter. But actually, that's why I wanted to be at that. It was the right thing for me to do at that time. I think we met a couple of years, a couple of years later, and I I remember the two of us sitting at our older children, Matty and Harvey. I remember sitting mm. at the Christmas play, and I was getting you know choked up seeing my son in his little you know drummer boy uniform, and then I I I I, I sort of looked across and saw you, and you were wiping tears away with your <laughs> with your silk tie. <laughs> I was, yeah, I had to go to work. I didn't that know you were talking. Obviously, all I, all I, I only knew you from, <laughs> from what I'd seen on television, right? With this guy in a Kevlar yeah. vest and a, and, a, and a helmet. And so it, you'd changed, right? And you'd changed pretty dramatically, obviously because of events, but also by didn't the fact you had, you, had, you had two kids. Well, you grow up, don't you? I mean, I was already in my 40s, but I was starting to grow up. I don't think, in my case, I don't think I started to grow up and really be a proper adult till I had children. Yeah. Um, and when you're young as well, you feel indestructible. Certainly I did. Mm. And then by that time I realized how destructible we are. Um, yeah. I've always been a bit of a sentimentalist, to be honest. I've always cried in films, but, uh, but yeah, of course, you know, I defy anybody not to in that situation. But yeah, I was I was no kind of a tough guy. I went to a lot of tough places, but I wasn't the sort of. Um, I actually think that as a journalist, if you're someone who doesn't feel anything, that you can't do a very good job. Well, you've had that, you know, experience in the in the most horrendous of ways. You mm. know, more recently, in 2018, you were diagnosed with bowel cancer. Um, yeah. That moment, you know, when the c word is used, you know, uh, for the first time, how how would you? just describe that and 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 how did you react well actually it was a bit bizarre i didn't have one of those moments you see in films or soap operas where you know you're ushered into the doctor's office mm. and he says you know sit down I've, I've got some bad news for you um what happened was i was having the one of the procedures a colonoscopy where they put a pipe in your rear end and with a camera attached and and I was going in and out. I was drugged. And I was going in and out of consciousness. And I heard two doctors saying, oh, yeah, yeah, it looks like cancer. I thought, what, cancer? But I was so full of opioids that mm. it didn't really bother me very much at the, at the time. Uh, and then to start with, they said, look, this isn't going to be a serious one. We'll whip it out and you'll be right as rain by Christmas. And turned out to be more serious than that and more complicated than that. And I was in hospital for a long time, for a month, and I had six months of chemo and I'm, you know, in remission now, but I'm hoping that'll stay the same, but it's, you know, it might, it might not. So 
I think I think I've actually I had a couple of when I was in hospital after my surgery and then things went wrong so that's why I was there for a month I had a few awful long nights of the cell where I started thinking the worst thoughts you can imagine but after a day or two I focused on you know getting on my feet getting out of the hospital I found there was a in my last night the last couple of nights I was feeling a bit better and I found that there was a 24-7 cost of coffee in King's College Hospital in London so I, I could never sleep so at three o'clock in the morning I pushed my drip stand down to the coffee place and get myself a, I couldn't face coffee I get a herbal tea yeah. or something like that and <laughs> and you know try and move around and um, and there was a, something of the journalist in me and that I was quite curious about the experience but no the implications clearly if you stop yeah. and think about them for more than two seconds are horrific but you know you've got to just get through the experience and hopefully and keep a positive mind i've always been i've always felt i'll get through it mm. and i maybe i'm fooling myself but i hope not uh, i've had the best of medical care um i continue to i mean still have a connection with the hospital i see them i've got a scan coming up in july i'm hoping everything will be all right He's good. Uh, and you know, so I think you've got again. You've got to, you've got to do one little thing at a time and get through it. These things are all cliches, but it's true. You need just just get through the day, get through tomorrow, and then and then have a horizon as well about when things will be better. When you yeah. get out of, in my case, you know, when when I got out of hospital, and then when I got out of chemotherapy, and then when I got through my first scan, and then another scan, things like that. Uh, and so far, so good. It's been going in the right direction. And I realize that might not be forever, but I'm hoping it will be. Well, uh, long may that continue. I remember, I remember talking to you just before you started your chemo and you were, you know, it was like a campaign. You know, you, you had a plan. You were, <laughs> you, you'd, you'd clearly immersed yourself in the detail, the medical detail. You knew exactly what was happening to you. You knew exactly what the sort of roadmap was ahead of you. It felt like uh, you were talking about it in a way as if, as if it were a campaign. Is that sort of... Oh, was I? The, the, does that sort of resonate? Well, I don't know. Um, something like chemotherapy has got a beginning, a middle, and an end because you know how long you're going to be doing it for. I knew I had to get through six months. Uh, so I, I've always put my faith in the doctors you know, I don't, I've, I do actually try and, I, I, do, I have looked at the medical detail, but only by talking to the doctors after a couple of, you know, terrifying, false bits of information I discovered via Dr. Google. <laughs> I've, uh, I've stayed away from Dr. Google. I've never Googled, you know, how long I, you know, people live with my particular tumor or anything like that. I don't want to. Um, but I've spoken a lot to doctors about it and the cancer specialists uh, at the hospital where I'm being treated. And so, yeah, I think you have to, yes, you need to have a plan. You always, I've always been quite well organized in that sense. I think you've got to try and have a plan about how to deal with something like that. And it was going to be, it took all of last year. So actually when uh, lockdown came, I was quite used to being stuck at home. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about COVID. Um, it's, you know, it's quite correctly described as a crisis, obviously, and most acutely for those who've you know, lost their lives or lost loved ones. And the economic shock of it is obviously going to uh, create a ripple of you know, proper financial crisis for, for millions of people. I'm interested, though, in your perspective, of this idea of sort of global crisis, because you're someone who's, as we've been discussing, you've seen towns, you know, cities, countries, communities ripped to bits by by actual war or civil unrest um is it right to describe this crisis as a war as a lot of politicians you know have done i understand why they use that kind of language but it's it's a bit i think it's in a way it's a bit more complicated than most wars in a war you know who your enemy is and you can identify them and yeah we know that covid is the enemy but we don't know where it, but it's invisible and it is different. Um, 
insofar as well wars are completely different to pandemics but i'll tell you where i think there is where it does touch and where it is what the one of the reasons why i think for so many people it has been so shocking is that we have been since the end of the second world war we've been very lucky in this country and in western europe and in pretty much in the u.s as well they've all been quite lucky insofar as that when our countries have fought wars whether in the americans it was vietnam or for us the falklands or the gulf war or you know afghanistan and iraq it's been done by in case of the british anyway not the americans in vietnam but it's been done by professionals uh a long way off hmm. and it hasn't involved anybody except those in that community uh in a really direct manner but where i think this comparison with the war and covid works is that we have been very lucky since the second world war in that we we haven't had a threat of sudden death hanging over us that could just come seemingly out of nowhere we haven't had had that now i've been in lots and lots of places where people live with that yeah. in a war and that's where the I think the similarity, it lies that if you live in most parts of Syria since 2011, for example, you live with this awful thing in the background, the war, well, very much in the foreground. But the common experience is that otherwise healthy people can su suddenly get ill and die, or even people with, who are already a bit ill can get even iller and die. And that um, the removal of that sense of security that I think that we had, even if we didn't even know it was there before, the removal of that sense of security is something which does happen in a war and has happened because of COVID-19. Uh, Jeremy, we're out of time. Thanks so much uh, for being so frank and for giving us what I think uh, is a, a really invaluable insight and perspective as we, um, you know, with this podcast, as we try and start this conversation on crisis. Before you go, Jeremy, I'd like to ask a final favour. Uh, we'll be asking all our guests to give us their crisis cures, three things that help them get through the dark days. There's only one rule. It can't be a person, though I'm sure there's a very long list of people who help you get through uh not least your partner julia so your crisis cures please well you know one thing andy is i think uh, domestic life and you can get this the, the whiff or the sniff of domestic life even when you're not at home and by domestic life i mean things like cooking dinner doing the yeah. washing uh those kinds of quotidian humdrum things which actually are quite reassuring uh there was one time i was working in damascus the war was going on you could hear the war through the window you could see smoke rising from the suburbs and for some reason uh to work in they'd given us this sort of room which had a little kitchenette the hotel had given us and it had a a cooker and it had a washing machine so instead of sending the laundry to the hotel laundry we all found ourselves using doing our own laundry and uh, save the BBC a bit of money but apart from that it was quite nice uh putting together a an edited story about the Syrian war with the sound of the of the washing machine in the background reassuring Spitting, comforting. Oh, reassuring yeah. and yeah. you know I, I I even made some dinner I invited round one of the few diplomats who was in the city there was a power cut of course it all got a bit mucked up uh the oven didn't work properly but we you know we got there in the end and so Wonderful. Um, I've done the same in Baghdad, doing the laundry. Fantastic. You put, you put the, in Baghdad in the summer, it's really dry and it's 50 degrees plus. So you put out your washing, even a thick pair of shorts on the washing line, they're dry in no time. So that is reassuring for me. That's one thing. Um, the, the, you know, the quotidian, the domestic. Um, finding something a little bit escapist, even if it's sort of related on tv you know i've been throughout the uh, coronavirus pandemic i've been uh, watching an episode every night of the wire uh, with my daughter but as uh, you know outside pandemics I, I quite 
watching i quite like watching these black and white films they used to have on sunday afternoons when i was a kid uh you know quite a lot of them were world war ii dramas submarine dramas or something mm -hmm. often john mills is involved in some way and uh, jack hawkins someone like that i found those quite you know reassuring to have on in the background maybe you know past crises even Very these good. fictionalized reminders of the fact that you know you do get out of them in the end um and uh, a third thing it's got to be, for me it's got to be exercise actually really i think it should be it's a top stress buster you know it's a so natural antidepressant running i used to do running i've got a knackered knee now which is a um a flare-up of an injury i got when i was playing rugby would you believe when i was in my 20s broke my leg quite badly so running is a bit out of it for me which is a real problem but i've got a bike now and, uh, you know, in Sarajevo, I used to take uh, a skipping rope. I used to skip in the stairwell um, of the hotel. You couldn't go outside, obviously. Um, and in Saddam's time, I used to go running uh, in Baghdad. I was about the only jogger in the whole of the city, you know, going past the various local police HQs, people looking at me as if I was insane. <laughs> insane. Why, 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 why are you running when you've got a perfectly good car? Um, that was, I think, the attitude of a lot of those guys as they, you know, smoked and and drank whiskey or sweet coffee or something. And so, yeah, so running, I think exercise in general, if you can do it, even if it's just a walk, it's a really good thing to do. Fantastic. Jeremy, thanks again for being our first guest. Andy, thanks for asking me. It's an honor. Thanks for listening to Crisis What Crisis. Do feel free to send us your feedback. You'll find our contact details and our show notes giving you the key insights from our guests at crisiswhatcrisis.com. There are more useful conversations on the way, so please do subscribe. And if you like what you hear, give us a rating and a review. It really helps. Thanks again.